All right, so <clears throat> this is uh, this is the first of of three videos that we're going to do on bass trombone. And um, my name is Matt Driscoll, and I teach trombone here at East Carolina University, um, and play bass trombone over in Durham Symphony. And that's kind of the reason why I wanted to start this video because um, because of uh, I play some bass trombone, and I'm starting to double, and um, I'm starting to see some weaknesses in my own bass trombone playing. And so I've called some experts here. Um, and then there's a couple other reasons I want to do this video for bass trombone versus the tenor trombone. Um, it's also to guide, it's a guide for band directors, um, for inspiring young bass trombonists, uh, students and professionals starting to double, like myself, and then studio teachers. So whatever um, will we'll help them out, I think we'll will be a good thing. Um, so now we're, uh, this is Jimmy Robertson and he's gonna give a, a brief introduction of himself and then on to Casey Thomas. Well, hello everyone, I'm Jimmy and uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, recording with uh, my two colleagues here and it's nice to reconnect. And uh, yes, so uh, I teach trombone at the University of Florida, and I also double on tenor and bass trombone. I approach it maybe from a d little different direction in that tenor has kind of been my primary instrument um, for the past 30 years. <laughs> um, and uh, and so, uh, but I, I really enjoy doubling on, on bass, and it's been uh, a really important part of my career. And uh, so for, I'll try to emphasize um, that aspect of it for me though to a certain extent if you go back far enough in all of our playing careers probably most trombonists started as ten trombone players and then migrate to bass that's usually the way it goes but then um you know i i started doubling really uh in, in college but then didn't really really get serious about it and, and until I, I was perhaps uh, in uh in one of the first jobs I played, I was in an Air Force band when I was in a position of doubling quite a lot then. But uh, again, it's nice to be here today and, and just a very brief uh, kind of bio background on me. I did my undergraduate studies at the University of Northern Colorado and I studied with a gentleman named Buddy Baker. And um, later as we talk through this topic, I'll probably mention Buddy Baker and his teaching philosophy several times because one of his texts, the Buddy Baker tenor trombone method, I think would be a really ideal approach to um, opening up the sound in the low register for a tenor player who wants to start doubling on bass. And then I'll mention several other um, players along the way. But um, w when I did my, my final ultimate uh, culminating degree at Northwestern University, I had the chance to study with three teachers. It was a team teaching situation with Michael Mulcahy, Charlie Vernon, and Randy Hawes, um, who are all um, fantastic uh, uh, musicians, but uh, who in, in one way or another double. Um, Michael Mulcahy, a tenor player who doubles very, very exquisitely on bass. Charlie Vernon is the bass drummer of Chicago Symphony who plays tenor and alto just like gangbusters. And Randy Hawes uh, is, plays in the Detroit Symphony. So having those influences really helped open up uh, my sound and uh, on on the instrument and I got a lot of insight from them and my colleagues to on how to negotiate that but but uh, I really enjoy um, <clears throat> that the act of doubling because I feel like it opens up a lot of different re repertoire that I can play and a lot of different musical um, situations that I can participate in so it's something that I hope that you all, if you're a band director out there tuning into this, um, encourage your young players to do. Because when I was in high school, that was kind of the first taste of when I started developing my low register and dabbling in a little bit. And it really led to a lot of things opening up in my career down the road. So um, in addition to just enjoying playing the, the, the low part down there. Um, it, it is something I think that's really helpful for developing sound for young players and uh, developing a cohesive uh, sound across a wide register. So I'll hand it over to Casey now. And uh, my name is Casey Thomas. I'm so happy to um, so happy to be here, and um, I'm, I'm grateful for Matt for putting this together. And good to see Jimmy again. Um, and my background is uh, I teach at uh, Jacksonville State University in Alabama, and that is not Florida, and that is not Mississippi, which is often the case misconstrued. But um, I did my undergraduate here, actually, and then got my master's and doctorate at the University of Iowa, where I studied with David Gear. And I am a little bit different than Matt and Jimmy in that I very much, no, I did not start on bass trombone in sixth grade, but 
by eighth grade, I was playing lower parts uh, in a community band and using maybe uh, a little larger equipment uh, to facilitate that. And then was a bass, truly a, having my own bass trombone by my junior year of high school, which is not as uncommon now as it might have been back when I was in high school. But, um, but I am grateful for having started that way. Um, and um, my philosophy uh, is I spent a lot of time around Charlie Vernon, not as a student, but uh, as an observer of his playing and teaching at, at the Brevard um, Music Center in North Carolina. And he would always come there for at least a week and just play with a choir and a trombone choir and then play with some wind ensembles or orchestra or all of the above. And, um, you know, he really views himself as a trombonist. Uh, he may be the bass trombonist with Chicago Symphony, but he is a trombonist. And I really, I like that. And I want my students to be trombonists. Um, and I wanted to make that myself that way in, co in graduate school as well. And then I'm also reminded to sort of help um, add a little more credence to that thought is, I remember when uh, Jim Markey won the bass trombone spot with New York and someone asked Joe Alessi, I mean, I was standing there and someone asked Joe Alessi, well, how did he sound? And he said, he said something to effect of, he sounded like a trombonist and he meant it as an ultimate compliment. Like it didn't matter that he had been a tenor trombone and been, you know, principal in Phil I mean, Pittsburgh and all that. He was a trombonist and he made it sound the way it needed to sound. So that is my approach overall is let's, let's sound like a trombonist and go from there. Awesome. <clears throat> Well, the first question, um, I'm, I'm going to start with uh, Jimmy. So, so how should a high school how should high school band directors implement and or use bass trombone with their band? And then I have a part two. I just came right. this a little bit ago. Um, when do you right. think a student should make the switch to bass trombone? Sorry about that. Yeah, I don't know if there's an ideal timeline for making a switch. I feel like uh, that could be highly variable based on their own development of uh, low register because there are some tenor players who ha just are naturally set up up high and um, it's going to be a slower process for them to open up sound in the low register and other players um, the low register can come quite naturally so i'd say the sooner you can get those players started on uh o opening up and and developing confidence down in the lower register the better they uh, why wait i think maybe one one important aspect to consider um on the bass drum one is just making sure that you have um good quality equipment on hand for them to double because if they're already you know renting or or owning an, a, a tenor it's going to probably be difficult for them to to do that on a second instrument so to get your band boosters working for you and have a good quality probably double valve bass trombone on hand for them to begin really exploring the lower register because modern wind band writing band parts uh, have really started to explore the bass trombone as a little bit more of an independent instrument and and being a little bit more akin to being tuba like in their register and much much more so than you know may, maybe 30 years ago when when uh i started doubling a little bit where the uh, you know uh bass trombone might have been third trombone now it's a little bit more identifiable explores the low register a lot more um significantly so the the sooner you can get students heading in that direction i think the better but again my philosophy really is to approach it from developing uh, the sound being a tenor player who doubles on bass and hypothetically taking tenor trombones or trombones from your section and identifying the ones who could who could uh really uh help out your band in that way is to help them develop their lower register on bass first on tenor um just uh so so i i think using a tenor trombone um to to explore the lower register is is quite effective because if we really come down to it we're talking a double valve bass trombone adds you chromatic chromatically for you one pitch a, a low b natural above a pedal b flat that's a bit of an oversimplification because having double valves gives you some options on on the low d d flat c and the b natural um but um it, when it all comes down to it you can explore that whole register down there um on on, on tenor and really open up your sound and, and quite effectively play a bass trombone part um 
on a uh, tenor trombone with, with, with a good low register. It'll fill out the sound more if you can capably have a good quality uh, bass trombone there. But um, th that would be just my advice to, to, to get some good equipment on hand and then cultivate tenor players to, to start doubling. And the other thing you can do is if you have an abundance of tubas, you, you can find a tubist who might want to double over on bass too, and that can be quite effective. And furthermore, I would add, some euphonium players can uh, grow into becoming quite spectacular bass trombones too. So depending on what uh, areas and depth you have in your band, if, if you have really have any of those low brass instruments in abundance and somebody who has a good low register, you can transfer them over. Um, I would add to that, and I completely agree with every bit of that. Um, and Jimmy's right that parts are in concert band music are becoming more, shall we say, bass trombone instead of third trombone like. Um, but even in writing that is just a third trombone, an extension of it, I think uh, very often band directors get in the habit of a top down mentality in their sections of best players on first and it just gets worse and worse as we go lower. Um, maybe there is some logical reality to that in trumpet, although I still don't agree with it there, but you know, as far as tessitura, that might may be necessary. But what the first thing I would do is encourage rotation of parts, um, getting your kids, this kid plays first on this piece and this that same kid then plays second or third on the next piece and the next piece and they all get a, a chance to play different parts and get it out of their head. I have a student here that came here literally to college and had that in mind that when he was put on second, that he was somehow less than, than um, if he had been put on the first part. That, that, that we have to get rid of, and it will make the band sound better if you get rid of that mentality. Um, I think, yes, cultivating, buying uh, the right equipment for your students is gonna be great. But even if you don't have the budget for that, um, yes, um, a tenor can sound very good on a lower part. Uh, they might could use a slightly larger mouthpiece to aid in that, but don't go too far with that. I very erroneously, in junior, when I was a junior high school, high school, would slap a Shilke 60 into my tenor and had the time of my life. But little did I know um, my tone was um, woofy, tubby. Um, definition wasn't there, intonation issues, um, but these things can be gotten around even if you do not truly have an actual bass trombone. It's just a mentality and a desire to make sure that the part is covered well. And uh, I, I think that's all I had on that. Okay, awesome. Those all are right, great points. Uh, next one, we'll, we'll start with uh, Casey. Um, what are major differences in air with bass trombone as compared to tenor trombone? Well, I'm going to be interested to see what, what Jimmy has to say on this. Um, I, I believe that, um, let's say we're playing a low F, uh, an F right there below the staff, and um, wherever we're playing it in first or six, um, and I'm playing it on a tenor trombone and Matt's playing it on a bass trombone, um, we are vibrating theoretically the same pitch and that we don't need to think too much harder than that as to, oh, well, I have a bass trombone. Well, guess what? It's still an F, okay? Now, the horn may be theoretically bigger, the bass trombone in your hand, and therefore it's going to require, um, uh, it's got maybe a little less back pressure and therefore it is taking air from you easier and you are having to spend it more often. Um, the way I would think then about air is let's make sure that we have a good constant column of air on tenor and then translate that to bass and do whatever it takes to grow up and create that on bass. I love the exercise where I will take my mouthpiece out of the horn and put my lips over the lead pipe and just sit there and blow, you know, uh, uh, Bordoni number two. Uh, and don't use any tongue whatsoever. And I'm in my mind, I'm trying to spin a pinwheel constantly, not fast, but just constantly. And if it starts to slow down, that means I'm losing air continuity. And if I can get that good while I'm holding a tenor in my mind, then I want to make that happen on the bass too. So it's just about, look, it's going to maybe take a little bit more air, but let's fill it up and let's make that pinwheel spin constantly. That's, that's what I think. 
Jimmy? Yeah, excellent point. And uh, yeah, regarding the air, I don't mean to be too flip about it, but and to a certain extent, I find there's virtually no difference in the air. When I'm playing lower in the low register on bass trombone and, and uh, perhaps playing louder, it, it takes more air. You have to breathe more. Um, but other than that, I don't really see a drastic difference in my air usage between tenor and bass trombone. Yeah. Um, however, I would say that it, I'm, I perhaps want to convey that to a certain extent on the bass trombone, um, in the in the trigger register, I frequently find that my bass trombone is a little more efficient in that register, in the sense that if I want to play with an equal volume and an equal amount of sound on tenor, it takes me more air on tenor, and on bass I can kind of relax. And I don't know if I'm using the air differently or be, because there's a little less, less pressure, I can relax on bass trombone. But in that register where the bass trombone flourishes it is set up to be a little bit more efficient is, than the tenor is in that register. So a little bit counterintuitively, I can find that I need to use more air proportionally on the smaller horn to get the sound that I want at that dynamic. And on bass trombone, it just flourishes easily. And, and to a certain extent, I use less air. Though saying less air with the room of trombone is dangerous. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Uh, but, but, uh, but, but yeah, I, I think really thinking about the efficiency of the air. Another concept I've really come around to is that um, uh, I feel like on bass trombone and in the low register on tenor, I want to be using a sufficient quantity of air in a relaxed way. Um, but but the speed of that airflow is is quite slow. So I typically find with younger students who begin doubling on uh, on tenor and bass that they frequently um, because they're so attuned to thinking about song and wind and Arnold Jacobs breathing a lot and moving a lot of wind and move more air, they tend to overblow the bass trombone and move air too fast, and it's too maybe um, hyper focused and it creates back pressure that isn't there. So I like to just make sure that, that I myself and my students are using an efficient airspeed that isn't too fast and wasteful because I find airspeed that is too fast causes the sound to be airy. It causes more resistance to the embouchure because we're resisting pressure that we ourselves are creating by overblowing the instrument. <laughs> and so it's it's a delicate thing that you have to kind of balance. But in short, make sure that your students are, are staying um, relaxed in their air column and invite them to consider that they want to be using a high volume of air, but at a low flow rate. So it's not a really driven fast air in the low register. Yeah. So... I don't know if there's a huge difference in the quantity, but there's a qualitative difference in the air. Okay, that's, that's good. Um, all right, so we started with Casey on that one. We'll start with Jimmy on this one. <clears throat> um, explain the difference, the differences or similarities in the embouchure. That's one thing that I kind of struggle with a little bit when I'm going to bass, when I've been playing a lot of tenor and that adjustment and I, I know, I'm pretty sure that's somewhat normal, but um, um, so this will be a good one to, to hear your answers from. Yeah, well, this question I feel ties in with one of your subsequent questions down further down the list regarding equipment, mouthpiece, etc. Because the, the extent to which the armature might change a little bit is kind of interwoven with what you're doing in terms of equipment. So coming at it from the perspective of a tenor who might be doubling on, on, on bass. Um, again, I don't want to be flip about it again, but I, again, don't find a huge difference in my embouchure. However, the lower I go, I tend to find that my corners come down a little bit in terms of my embouchure. And one of the developmental things I really am attuned to or had to go through was I found on bass, I would find myself being lazy here with the corners. Because the instrument is so efficient at producing a sound there in this mid-low register that I could get away with being a little lazy with, with support. And then the lower I go, I was having trouble with consistency, with control of articulation, with um, matching the sound across registers. Um, so I found that if I applied the, the kind of discipline of keeping uh, my corners engaged, this diamond-like shape here, mm -hmm. keeping that essential structure engaged, no matter how low I went on the trombone, that really helped me. 
So I feel like one of the differences is that a young player, they might give away the structure to play a pedal B flat and lower. They just lose all structure and let you know the lips flap. And so it can help you connect your sound from the mid down into the pedal register through the trigger register, etc. If you maintain the, the structure of the, the formation here that supports it outside the rim of the mouthpiece. I, what I have encountered young students doing is being too willing to compromise any of the support structure outside the rim and doing it all inside the rim. So everything just becomes kind of flabby out there, you know? So essentially keep this diamond of possibility here. That, that's a term from one of my teachers from John Swallow. He called it the diamond. Uh, so, so keeping that engaged to a certain extent, the lower you go, the less, the less clenching you need, or maybe clenching isn't the best word, but support you need. But I find if I let go of it too much, then, then, uh, things begin to suffer, whether it's pitch center of sound or, um, responsiveness. Cool. <clears throat> One of the ways in which I feel like I can identify when that is happening, what Jimmy is talking about this, uh, undiamond shape of embouchure one of the ways that i feel like i can notice that is the lower we go um the there's like a dead center to every note and the lower we go there's more and more what i call fudge below the note and so you'll hear a kid go i'm going to sing up an octave but they'll try to play a low b flat a valve f and a pedal b flat okay and they'll go do Oh, and they will have fallen down and sagged down. And that's how I know that they've, they've done what Jimmy is talking about. One way in which we know that, that they've done what Jimmy is talking about. And they have gone down into the fudge instead of finding the dead center of the note, the most resonant spot. And they can't find that really, I don't think, without doing things correctly here and being, shall we say, firm enough, um, not tense, but firm enough as, as to this diamond that, that um, John Swallow talked about. Yeah, that, that's an ob awesome observation. And I would just sort of follow up with that with an observation about the relationship of air and embouchure here. I have found with students who give away that structure, they tend to, like, like Casey said, in the pedal register, they'll tend to blow flat and it'll sound dull and airy. Yeah. But and those same students, when they get into the mid and upper register, because they're lacking a little support here, tend to get tight and pinched and buzz on the high side of the pitch in that register. So that so that lack of structural engagement causes buzzing high of the center of pitch or sharp in the mid and upper register and flat in the low register. So having just the right structure there can help even that out and cause them or help them stay more in the core center of the pitch um, if, if they engage that in the right way. Okay, very cool. Um, so and this is the question that you're referring to that that can help out the armature possibly. So the mouthpiece, um, what are some good mouthpiece suggestions or choices for new bass trombonists? Um, I don't know if if um, age would matter, like high school versus college versus um, someone like myself starting <laughs> doubling about two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what what are your thoughts on that? And I think Casey is starting on this. Okay. One. Yeah, uh, I and, and I wanted to go back to uh, just a. This will actually dovetail quite nicely, but. Um, when you guys were talking about embouchure differences and, and Jimmy's right, I don't think there really is that much, but what I really like about, um, shall we say the embouchure differences is that when I play a lot of tenor and it is a smaller mouthpiece than my bass, obviously, and I do a lot, a lot of tenor playing when I go back to the bass, man, I'm on fire as far as feeling like I am dead center. Everything is just, responding so much better actually and it took me a long time to get to that point it wasn't until grad school where i really felt like i, I loved playing tenor because then i for multiple reasons but then also because i would jump over and play bass and just feel very efficient um so um i actually embrace that that idea that the different sizes um can be beneficial but to only a point and now we're going to answer i'm going to try to answer your question um, a lot of kids will 
um, go to buy a bass trombone mouthpiece and they will just automatically think bigger is better. And, and they'll go buy the biggest dang thing they can. And again, back to when I was in high school, it was like, um, the first bass trombone mouthpiece I ever played was a Bach one and a half G. And then I was informed that there are other mouthpiece manufacturers. And so then I got a hold of a, of a Shilke uh, manual and holy cow, look, there's a 58 and a 59 and even a 60 and they're all bigger. And oh my goodness, let me go order that big um, 60. And um, I just would say, if I'm going to transition from tenor to bass, to not go too far away from your home base, whatever that tenor mouthpiece is that you're using, and, and maybe sort of build yourself down to only what you need. If you can achieve everything you need to, I, I have a friend in Atlanta, she's an incredible player, and she can do everything on a 2G with more facility than I can on something far bigger than that. And um, it's just like, it does not need to be big. It just needs to work for you. And so then she still has an incredible upper range and she doesn't um, sacrifice anything in the low. So I would just say, to sum it up, no, don't go too big maybe work yourself down to what you can handle and don't, and don't jump in the deep end of the pool before you can handle it. And lastly, if you really like the feel of your tenor trombone mouthpiece, maybe try to find the same sort of feels. So if it's uh, the contour of a Doug Elliott that you like, well, try to maintain that. Um, you don't have to, but that would, that would just make the transition easier instead of more abrupt and uh, potentially jarring. Okay. Oh, that's a great observation. Yeah, in short, for a tenor trombonist doubling on bass, I would strongly suggest that their go-to first choice would be uh, something the equivalent size of a Bach 2G. Yeah. And I say that because I I have played a Bach 2G on bass trombone for 29 years. <laughs> uh, I started doubling uh, on bass when I, when I auditioned at Northern Colorado into the lab bands there. I, Audition in the second band, they needed a bass trombone, and Buddy liked my low range. So he set me up on a 2G, and for the first nine months while I saved up money to buy a bass trombone, I played a 2G in my tenor trombone. And since then, I, I got a, I got a, a, a double trigger, you know, uh, Bach bass trombone, put put that 2G in there, and, and I've never switched. That's not to say I haven't invested a lot of money in different mouthpieces looking for that magic solution. Because it's bigger, always is seductive and always does seem to help in, in some ways. But when I switch to bigger equipment than a 2G, I start finding myself having um, uh, troubles with centering sound in the upper register, trouble or in the mid register, um, um, uh, having a consistent core sound articulation issues in me. But again, I'm a player who is always doubling back and forth. So I think if I did settle into solely and more regularly playing only bass trombone, I might migrate to bigger equipment. But because I always keep those doubles going and want to be fluent back and forth, I think the the two G or an equivalent is a really good choice. I don't have the exact numbers on on like Shilky or or Griego or Greg Black, all those numbers and how they equate. But you can look that stuff up. But I do um, definitely follow the mantra that uh, Alan Vizzuti shared with in a master class that I went to when I was a kid. He said you want to play the smallest equipment that you sound great on. You want to play the smallest equipment that you sound great on. So yeah, you can play on stuff that's too small, that's not ideal for you, and, and I'm not necessarily advocating for that. But you can also really get um, uh, enamored with some of the tonal sonic possibilities of playing on really big equipment. It's really nice. It's really fun. But there are always trade-offs, and, and so um, I, I think a good starting point is something in, in the, the realm of, of a 2G, and that's what I continue to play on today. I have two of them. I, I have a bass in my office and a bass here at home so I can, I don't have to carry my tenors or basses back and forth from work. I bike from work to and from work, so I can't do that anyway. Um, so that, 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 that works out well for me. Uh, but uh, again, I, I do have several other, a collection of, of incrementally larger mouthpieces that I experiment with. And in some cases, uh, recently playing with the American Trombone Quartet, I've, I've switched at times, like when we've played something extraordinarily low, where I'm playing the equivalent of a contra bass trombone part <laughs> on a tenor or something that's really low for me. Um, and and, and I, I might switch in the short term, but by and large, I, I 
my bread and butter go to is is that 2G. And I, I feel like it's really effective to put that in a tenor and really explore the lower register and it works well on bass too. And and it 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 allows me the flexibility to still play my alto, to still play my tenor, to still play my small bore jazz horn and not have too much of a trade off. And like Casey was saying, I have more and more found the complementary aspects of doubling. It rather than it being a situation where I have to solve the problems in the doubling, I continually find how much doubling helps other aspects of my playing. When I'm playing a small horn alto, boy, does that help the centering of sound on tenor. When I spend a lot of time on bass I, and I go back to tenor, my air support is so easy and natural. Playing a lot of bass the last few years has really helped me finally develop a lot more relaxation in my playing on tenor. So. Um, I, I, I think from a young kid, I, I, I was slow to acknowledge how tense I was in playing. And, and so developing efficiency on bass and freedom of airflow has really helped, I think, continue to elevate my tenor trombone playing because I want to be on a path of continual improvement. And doubling, I have found, really helps all around. So it's something I'd encourage you band directors to help your trombonists do to help them you know, grow as musicians in general. I wanted to add two things to that, uh, Matt. I completely agree that a 2G is a fantastic transitional mouthpiece and can, like I said, like Jimmy said, be um, uh, a long term for some people. And a 2G, I don't think, is too big and therefore negative consequences in a tenor. Um, I think maybe getting bigger than that, there could be some negative consequences. But 2G seems to work okay in a tenor. Um, and then... Uh, I am envious of Jimmy, and I'm envious of my friend in Atlanta uh, who can do everything. They can do everything they pretty much want to do on a 2G. But for some of us, it just I just can't do it, and that's okay. Um, and Jimmy's certainly not saying that it isn't okay. I'm just saying it is okay for anyone listening to this. If you just, man, I've tried a 2G, something of that size in another brand, and it ain't working. Well, that's fine. Then you go do what you got to do. Great. Yeah. It's almost like um, trying to find the right pair of shoes, I guess. Mm -hmm. I've, I've and and everybody has different size feet. So, you know, um, telling someone, oh, well, you must wear a size 12 shoe. Well, that might be ridiculous for <laughs> um, for the one person or the other. Yeah. Yeah. The the, the musculature of, of our, our lips, the fullness uh, or fleshiness of our lips can change. For, for different people, um, we, we all are slightly different <laughs> configurations. So, so what I, I have fairly thin lips. So for me, playing on on uh, a two G seems 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 to work. And so, it uh, is what works for me. But again, get moving aside from the equipment, it it really uh, comes down to what eases the path forward forward for you, and then you can specialize and branch out mm -hmm. from there. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we don't want um, Shaquille O'Neal wearing a size 12 sneaker. <laughs> that would be kind of funny. Yeah. And ridiculous all at the same time. <clears throat> um, I forgot who, who's starting this one. I think now. Jimmy is. is Jimmy's Jimmy? up. Okay. So what are the best ways to approach double valves when, when everything is just completely new? Or maybe you've <laughs> went from a single valve and then all of a sudden double valve. Yeah, um, playing slow scales and arpeggios. I think developing a very small collection of uh, of uh, technique or 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 uh, etude books and some that I would recommend the Buddy Baker tenor trombone method. I think is really good. Um, uh, I also would recommend uh, the uh, <clears throat> the Clay McDonald method. Uh, Clay uh, is. Uh, Australian bass trombonist and it's a two volume work McDonald was his teacher who played in England and uh, it, it really good at bridging sound um, across registers um, but developing the technique on on the second valve again there there are um, died in the wool bass trombonists who approach the second independent valve more independently than I typically do so I typically use my second valve, even though I have an independent valve bass trombone. And just for your bass trombone or non-bass trombonists out there, I'll mention that you know uh, uh, on the horn, like when when I play 
the F valve, I can use the G flat valve independently. So this is a large bore B flat, F, D bass trombones. So B flat is the open tenor trombone or bass trombone. F is using the first valve here. And then it's in D when you depress both valves with it, just for the um, uh, directors out there needing a review of all this stuff. Because over time, the intonation or uh, tuning systems of these valves has changed a little bit. So this is kind of the standard and has been for a while. But um, some bass trombones are dependent, so or bass trombones are dependent in that you can't use the second valve unless you're also engaged in the first valve. But most of them today are, are dependent. But still, I use it more as a dependent system, though occasionally I might use the, the second valve independently. But I would say the most effective way to develop fluency with it is to take a lot of care with how you tune it initially. So soon, tune your B-flat F D bass trombone that way. So when you tune a B-flat in tune in first position, then tune your F attachment so the F is in tune in first position. I have a lot of young players who like to tune it so the C is in tune in first and I have to uh, maybe invite them around to a different perspective because if you tune it to a so C is in tune in first, then the F is so flat down there that you can't use it. And then I would also tune it so that the D is in tune in first position. So you can play that B flat major arpeggio down to the pedal range with each of those three lining up in tune. And then um, from there, uh, I, I would just uh, suggest in each of the valves, just do some simple intervallic work and kind of develop a mental map um, and certainly you can con consult some um, uh, fingering charts. Uh, but fingering charts on, on double bass trombone are a little less relevant. There's there's a really nice one, though it's very, very detailed on the Doug Yeo website. Doug Yeo, a prominent pedagogue in our discipline, um, played with the Boston Symphony. He maintains a website full of a lot of materials, and he has two different positioning charts up there that are valuable. Another book by Micah Everett, which is very much on this topic, um, doubl doubling for tenor trombone players. Or, shoot, what's the exact title? I've got it here. Could probably share the title with you um but uh it uh, let me see if i can pull up this exact title my apologies it should be right here it's called the low brass player's guide to doubling also has an efficient chart in there because each each time you change these valves um so uh, as you know on tenor trombone there's seven positions well when you use the f attachment we only have six positions now and then when you use both of them, the F and the D, when the D is engaged, now you only have five positions, but they all are on the same continuous slide. So the, the first position you want to line up on all three, but then second position on the B flat side of the horn is slightly different from second position on the F side is again, slightly different from B flat or uh, from the D side of the horn. So it gets a little overwhelming first. So making sure that a student has develops a good mental map of that. So they're accurately placing pitch because the dirty little secret down here is that it, for you directors out there, when you have a young player learning to double down here is they can kind of get in the ballpark with their slide and then lip the pitch around down here a lot. And it's detrimental to their sound and their embouchure a little bit, but they can learn a, an incorrect or not ideal position and still play it relatively in tune, though it starts to affect the timbre because you can bend the pitch quite a lot down here. So in, in essence, I would just invest some time there in making sure they develop a really, really good mental map of where exactly those positions lie. Um, I am a little more um, into the independent use of the second valve. Um, and I agree that I want everything to be playable in first position. So I want my B flat side of the horn, the open side of the horn to be playable in first. I wouldn't want anything tuned to that great. And then I would want the low F to be in tune on the first valve. I would not want it so far in, like Jimmy was talking about, some player, players want the C to be in tune. And then now the F is obsolete. I just don't understand the logic of allowing something in first position to be obsolete. Right. Um, uh, and then he talked about the D and that's both valves together being in tune. And I would like for the G flat to also be in tune. Here's the point for me. I don't want anything to be flat in first position, the B flat, the F, the G flat and the D. And so if that means that one of those four or three F G flat or D has to be further out 
in order for everything to be playable, then so be it. And the student just needs to understand that and know that and, and proceed from there. And then that affects everything further out. Now, to answer your question about what materials I would use or how I would go about learning how to use this valve, I would start, most of them have a complete understanding by the time you hand them a bass trombone about, okay, I've got C in what we'll call flat first, and then we've got B in flat, flat two, what I call it flat, flat two, okay? And unfortunately, a lot of tenor trombonists think that is literally it. Uh, C and B, they come to college that way and that's all they've got. And we've, we've all were there at some point. Um, well, but then there's B flat and there's A and there's A flat and there's a, not a great G at the end of the slide, okay? Well, theoretically, if I'm in C in flat one, hopefully just up a half step right here is D flat. So what I'll have my students do is they'll just start on C and they'll go C, D flat, and then they'll go down to B and then B, C, B flat, A, da, da, da. And I want them to associate that whatever I'm doing on the first valve, I can go up a half step and play on the second valve. And then we go as low as we can possibly go and then we introduce the first step that I do is introduce when we're coming to both valves is D, D flat, C, B, and even B flat out in seven, the pedal yeah. B flat. Yeah. And then we can go from there, but it's like getting them to understand the functionality of it. And in addition to all the books that Jimmy talked about, what I really like to do is hand them the super simple Bordner book one that is just cake easy at the very beginning, half notes and quarter notes, and have them start taking them down an octave and enforcing them, hey, I want you for now to play every F on the second valve and every E flat on the second valve. And, and they'll find that, okay, well, in this situation, you know what, that actually made things easier. But in this situation, playing the F there, that wasn't smart. I would rather play it up here in first. And so you make them go learn um, you get them to really learn the alternates because by the time they're handed a bass trombone, they've played a thousand, a hundred thousand Fs in first. How many have they played out here in flat two? Not that many. So we've got to increase the amount of comfort and then they can decide what is best in this situation contextually. Awesome. Yeah, and I've been lately exploring that more and more, the independent usage, and I find it like really helps because there are so many situations where using that s second valve F and, you know, flat two, uh, like helps negotiate passage work and, mm -hmm. and so many of the other com combinations that I've lately been coming around to it. And, and, uh, and also it's just kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when your right hand gets used to it. <clears throat> I mean, mm -hmm. your left hand, I mean. <clears throat> um, all right, so where are we at now? All right, so that, how about that? We're going to explain the left hand position with the double valves and how to support the weight of the instrument. That's something I struggle with. I feel like, a, I don't know, I just feel like a, a weakling sometimes. <laughs> well, playing. I guess I'm first on this, and I, I'm happy to do it because um, let's – uh, let's get rid of any sort of um, um, man. I just must not be, I would not want you to think you're a weakling is what I'm trying to say, Matt. Um, it is a heavy instrument and there are even players where the tenor trombone is a heavy instrument, you know, and that's okay. Uh, and modern science is here to help us. Like I am in love with these bullet braces and with the get a grip that Newell Sheridan makes in Birmingham. And there are others besides that, but um, I, I just, it's like, here is something to help you and why not use it? And so um, I, I very much encourage my students to buy something along those lines to help out because it can be really painful and really detrimental to endurance. And you can actually, I mean, I actually had a student one time that pressed so hard on their face and it was because of their left hand tension so hard that they were actually moving their teeth. And, um, and that's got that one. That's, that's just gotta be not, not pleasant at all. Uh, 
And, and those braces are not a be all end all fix the problem, but boy, do they help. They really do help and they may fix the problem completely. So I would suggest that. And then the only other thing I'd say about the left hand is just make sure you're not gripping it too hard and, and that you can access every lever um, fully, not just say the tip of the thumb or anything like that. You may need to maybe beef up uh, the width of the, of the rod that you're putting your thumb on or uh, whatever. It just, just needs to be comfortable. But the main thing really is the load bearing. I'm really a big fan on helping out the load bearing. Yeah, I am too. Um, that helps so much. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the Sheridan Get a Grip. Um, for the band directors out there, it's just like a small leather. I've got one somewhere in the room. I just don't want to take the time to pick it up right now. But it's just like a small leather clip, which sort of clips on, on right of the horn. And it, you essentially, you just rest the weight of the horn right there. And it kind of balances and it helps so much. The Edwards uh, bullet braces are help. That's what I typically have on this horn. Unfortunately, I just happened to take it off recently. because. But it's been so valuable for me to have that the last few years. Because typically when we've been on the road with the ATQ, we're playing at least an hour and a half, hour and a half long program. And for me to hold the bass trombone that, that long, is just it hurts even with the bullet brace, you know what I mean? But it helps so much. Um, and uh, another one that I have uh, on my other bass trombone is uh, I have a Griego brace. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I misspoke. A Greenho brace. Mm -hmm. So um, it was designed by Gary Greenho. And Greenho, uh, even though he closed up his shop, sold all of the instrument designs and everything to Shilke. So Greenho trombones are being made. And uh, they are also making those bullet braces, or not bullet braces, but the Greenho brace to attach to the horn. So that I actually, I found just the right placement where I exactly where I wanted it. Took it to a really good instrument program and have them soldered it in place. So it's on on the horn permanently there. But that helps a lot too. And another one um, is I have a... Uh, it's like it's like a little pogo stick that attaches to the bottom brace of your slide. Trying to do either of you remember the name of this? The uh, oh uh, no, I don't remember. Um, I'm embarrassed. I'm basically on the edge. But a few years ago, I had like an injury, so I had to uh, in my and so I was getting some like numbness in my left arm. So while I was oh, in, uh, do you mean the ergo bone? The ergo bone. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had an ergo bone while I was playing Nutcracker for like six weeks, you know, uh, to negotiate that, and it helped me so much. And then, you know, when, once I graduated from PT and I was all good to go again, I, I, I haven't had to use that really, but I, I still have an occasional I'll set up students with it, will experiment with it, but that can be really helpful because uh, it, it'll support the weight of the instrument. But each time you introduce one of those changes, it changes a little bit how you how you hold the horn, so it takes a little bit of adjustment. The other thing I would suggest you do is. Uh, um, all you players out there is make sure that you, you uh, adjust this to just the right place. So typically the F attachment is not as adjustable. It kind of lives where it lives, but um, the, the G flat valve typically can, you can adjust that paddle so you can get it in an ideal place or, or like Casey mentioned, you, you can build it up or take it to a, a, a repairman who can get it in, in just an ideal lo location for your physicality. One other thing about the get the get a grip is that it is easily detachable, whereas the bullet brace. I have a bullet brace on my base and uh, it's fine, but I like to get a grip. I have a a, a student here and she is a very petite um, tenor and bass, and she doesn't mess around. She she can lay it down, but she could take that thing off her tenor and slap it on her base like that. So I dig the uh, the uh, modular modular aspect of it, shall we say? Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. Cause you don't have to get out a screwdriver, right. or attach it and everything, go wherever you want. It's great. Oh, that's cool. <clears throat> All right. So the, the very last question, um, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have a video too, where we'll have, we'll feature Jimmy and he's going to show some, uh, demonstrations on what he does in his personal playing and, uh, and with his students. And then, a, a follow-up video of that will have Casey will be doing some of the same things um, later on later on in the month maybe before the end of the year um, mm -hmm. so our last question for the day is uh, what is your double valve notation system and this could be a fully loaded question or it could be simple and and if you feel like you need some time for your <laughs> for your personal video then that's uh, that's fine too 
I'm sort of embarrassed to admit that I rarely write it down. I, I know where the valves go and I know which positions I want to use, but when I do notate it for students, I typically use the V method. So one V and the position means like first valve, so the F attachment. Um, and then two Vs stacked on top of each other, each other means, um, means uh, <clears throat> to use both valves. But then it gets into, the, well, what, what notation system do you use with the second valve? Well, sometimes I'll use 2V, and as in that means to me second valve. But another uh, system, uh, what I call the Doug Eo system, though I don't know if he came up with it, is to, you know, if you just put a position down, that means the position on the B-flat side of the horn. And then if you put, like, for example, 3F, that would mean the th third position for F attachment or... 3D would be third position for D attachment, or 3G flat would be third position on the G flat side of the horn. But just know that third position on the G flat side of the horn is in a different place than third position on the B flat side of the horn, so they're variable. But there, there are pluses and minuses to each of those systems. I wish I had like a really, really great answer for that, but I typically um, don't write it down in my own music that often unless there's a moment where I'm forgetting it or something. But, but. Uh, but when I convey it to students, I, 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 I try to explain it each time. I'd be curious, Casey, which system you prefer and what you use for consistency. Well, I developed my own, actually. Um, cool. I actually, I, I say I developed my own. Uh, funny story, I have an ex-girlfriend that thinks she planted the idea in my head. But whatever, I think I developed the idea. Cool. Um, and it's, it is based off of this. I, I think that most students can handle seeing whatever. But sometimes I wonder if seeing something like um, G flat three, when I'm playing an E natural or a G natural might potentially be confusing, right? Um, it's very confusing. I agree. It, it can be. And, you know, and so the idea is, well, can we come up with something that there is no confusion and that has nothing to do with music, the musical alphabet or uh, numbers? So like I wouldn't want to number them one, two, three, valves or one, two, and four. I don't know. What I thought up was three letters that are sequential that have nothing to do with music. And they also help us transition from tenor to bass. And here it is on a tenor with only one valve, which is typical, just one valve, right? That's the X valve. And on a bass trombone, the first valve, the F valve is the X valve. So those are the same valve from tenor trombone is typically pitched in F. And the first valve on a bass trombone is pitched in F, and that is X. And then the second valve is Y, the letter Y. And guess what? Both valves together is Z. So X, Y, Z. And so when a student transitions from tenor to bass, they already know when I say, well, man, maybe you want to play that in X flat four. Uh, oh, okay. Well, that's the first valve. They already know that. And then they can just easily conceptualize okay well then y is the second valve and z is both of them together so i'll just say hey play that d in z4 play that g flat in y flat one That's and awesome. um and i don't use flat signs i use a minus or a plus so i don't want to have a flat when we're playing a flat or a sharp or anything like that again just eliminating confusion uh, oh, that's that's for, great. Do you mind if I ask a point of clarification about the minus and plus for you? Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you use the minus and plus, uh, because I also do the same thing, but for me, minus means subtract slide and plus means add slide. And uh, I'm wondering. Yeah. So uh, I do it the opposite, as in if flat <laughs> means send it that way, send it flat. Yeah. Okay. Flat. Uh, so if I were to say uh, Y flat one, we're playing on the second valve in a lowered first position. Yeah, that makes sense. But what about the plus and minus? So if it was like Y minus one or Y one minus, or maybe a three would be a better example. Uh, yeah, so um, plus would be raise it for me. So okay. um, X uh, plus plus um, four means X sharp sharp four in my book. Okay. Meaning bring it up two shades. Um, and yeah, that, there can be some confusion there, but it's, um, I, I, for most students, when I introduce that, they're, they're not, they've gotten to college and they've not been so um, indoctrinated one way or the other that it's not that hard for them to get on board. 
And, yeah. and the X, Y, Z is just simple logic and it seems to work for them quite well. No, that, that's a great system. I'm glad you shared that with us. I might consult with you more on it and see if I can uh, give you credit and, and adopt it. Well, <laughs> as long as it's me and not the ex-girlfriend, we're going to be just fine. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I think actually, uh, my, if, if, when I do my own, um, Matt, when we come back and do the third video, I may try to, um, talk about that and, um, a little bit more, maybe with some graphics, uh, because I don't, I would like some time maybe to, to get those graphics together perfectly. They're not quite there yet. So that may be my, my video. Okay. Great. That sounds good. <clears throat> well, um, well, thanks for both of you for tuning in and oh, helping out hard. and answering your questions and, um, sharing your time and sharing your knowledge. And, um, well, and thank you, Matt. It's uh, great for you to put this together. And, and um, I know you're using this to help your own playing, but also, you know, it's going to help others too, potentially. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks for spearheading uh, the project. And uh, it was nice to reconnect and I learned a lot today. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, same here. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I guess as sort of like a, a, a parting word to young players out there um, or directors is, we, we've been to, we've been focusing, I think, justifiably on some of the um, mechanical and logical things about um, uh, doubling. But one of the really, really most important things I'm sure my colleagues agree with is developing that internal concept of the sound you're going for. So uh, a, a bass, a tenor player doesn't become a bass trombone player, uh, a great bass trombone player by putting in a bigger mouthpiece or, or, or putting a $5,000 double valve bass trombone in their hands. They really have to like develop the sound concept. So again, doing a lot of listening to great players out there. We're fortunate enough to live in a time where there's so much great content out there um, where you can, you know, from Spotify, iTunes, dare I say YouTube, uh, just listen to great players playing great music on, on the horn and develop a, a, a sound concept in your mind that you're going for because that's equally, if not maybe even more important than the mechanics and the equipment is having that internal concept that you're going for. Amen. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Thank Matt. You. Thank you.